Chapter 8.1, Points, Lines, Planes, and Angles. So in this chapter, we're going to begin exploring geometry, but we have to start from the basic building blocks to get there. So to begin, we have um, points and lines. So a line is a straight connection between a set of points that extends infinitely in either direction. A unique line can be created between any two distinct points. So here we have the points A and B, and we call the line that stretches between them line AB. Notice we have this special notation for lines where we write the two um, letters that represent the points on the line with a line over top of them with arrows extending in either direction. This says that the line goes on infinitely either way. Also of note is that, well, what if we had another point here, point C? We could call this line AC. We could still call it AB. We could call it CB. We could call it BC. We could call it a, uh, BA. Any of these are acceptable names for this line, as well as a few others I haven't written. All we need is two points on the line. Just pick any two points, they will define a distinct line. If there are more points on that line, it's up to you. Just pick whichever ones feel right to you. As long as they are all what is called collinear, meaning on the same line, then it doesn't matter which two you pick. Next we have a ray. So a ray is a half line, meaning that it includes an end point and then extends infinitely in only one direction. An end point means a point that ends our um, figure, our line, but we're stopping it at some point, so it's no longer a line in one direction. Um, now it actually does matter which order we write the points in. We want to start from our end point and head towards a different point. Um, so in this case, ray AB means it starts at A, that is the end point, and then heads towards B and off infinitely. Ray BA means it starts at B and heads towards A and goes off infinitely. Again, if we had some point C in here, I could call this Ray AC and that would be fine. But I absolutely couldn't call it Ray CB because C is not the end point. And we wouldn't call this Ray BA because again, even though B and A are both there, B is not the end point. This needs to be the stopping point or starting point of the ray so that the symbol with the arrow essentially shows start here and go off towards B. Finally, we have a line segment, which is just a piece of a line between two endpoints that does not extend infinitely at all. So here we're back to we can um, name it in whichever order, line segment AB is the same thing as line segment BA, but if there was a point C in the middle, well, line segment AC would be the line segment just from A to C, so this would be AC, or CB would be this part of it, but AB is the only way we can get the whole thing. So these are, because these are endpoints and we need to be specific about them. Now we're going to um, bring back a little bit of the notation we learned when we talked about set theory. So using the line AD below, determine the following. Ray AB intersected with ray DC and line segment BC unioned with ray CD. So remember the intersection means what is in common. Where do they intersect? What, where do they have the same parts? So first we need to identify what is ray AB? Well, ray AB means it starts at A and heads in the direction of B, but then just keeps going. Uh, ray DC means it starts at D, heads towards C, and then keeps going. So what do they have in common? Well, they have in common this middle part from A to D. 
beginning at A, stopping at D, or beginning at D and stopping at A, however you want to think about it, but either way it is a line segment AD. Next for our union BC with a uh, segment BC with ray CD, segment BC is just this part of our line. While, while ray CD starts at C, heads towards D, and keeps going. So when we union them, remember that the union equals combine everything. So if I combine B, uh, segment BC with ray CD, I'm just sort of laying them on top of each other on my line, and I'm left with starting at B, heading towards C, and going off infinitely. So I can call this uh, ray BC or ray BD as I've written here, either is an appropriate name for it, um, but that is the union, we're adding these two things together. Our next um, type of figure is a plane. So while points are considered zero dimensional, lines are considered one dimensional, planes are now a two dimensional surface that extends infinitely in two dimensions. Okay, so we can think about like a wall or a piece of paper or something like that, but it extends in every direction. It's a flat uh, surface, but it's going off infinitely. Um, two lines in the same plane that do not intersect are called parallel lines. And a unique plane can be formed from any three points that are not on the same line, non-collinear, uh, or a line and a point, because we know that a unique line comes from two points, and then a single point off of that is now the third point that's not on that line, so three points together. Why is that? Why does that form a unique plane? Because we know if we have two points, right, let's think of uh, the tips of my um, index fingers as two points, we can create a line between them, right, and it is a unique line. I'm going to make that with my pen here. Unique line between these two points. And if I move the points around, it's still a unique line. There's no other line I could form between them. But why is that, why do I need a third point to make a unique plane? Well, if I just grab a piece of paper real quick, let's see. To make a plane, well, let's say I have my two points. I'm going to make a plane using this piece of paper. Well, if I try and place them on top of my two fingers, right, it, it, it doesn't stay in one place, right? It could be in any direction. It just sort of, it's not balanced. But if I, play, if I have then three points and I try to make it stay balanced, I can. This is on three points. As soon as it's only two, it falls off. So that's kind of why we need the three points to define a single plane, because that allows us to balance it. Think of a table, right? A table would need at least three legs. Four is more balanced, sure, for actual tables, but we need three legs to form, like three skinny legs to make the surface flat, right? Um, so that's kind of what we're talking about here, is three points can give us a plane. Now a line in a plane divides the plane into three parts, the line itself as well as two half planes. So we can often think of um, your main experience with planes has probably been the XY plane, which you would have talked about in algebra um, in the past, whenever the last time is you took algebra. The XY plane looks like following, right? We've got these two lines going through it, our y-axis and our x-axis. We're not going to get too into graphing and all that, don't worry, I'm just bringing it back to something that you've probably seen before. The y-axis splits our xy plane into two halves, or the x-axis does as well, because they are lines within the plane. That's generally what we're talking about here. But what about how do planes um, interact with each other? So the intersection of two distinct planes ends up being a line. As we can see here, if I took two, you know, my two pieces of paper and put them against each other, you would be able to see 
that uh, where they intersect is just this straight line, right? That's the only place that they're touching. Two planes that do not intersect are then, of course, parallel planes, like again, these two pieces of paper. If they were to extend infinitely out, they would be parallel to each other because they would never touch. Um, two lines that do not lie in the same plane and do not intersect are then called skew lines. So skew lines, we can see I have a picture of two skew lines here. Uh, line CD and line AB a, B are skew lines because they are, you have to picture this three-dimensionally now, they are lines that are just never going to touch. They extend out infinitely in their two directions, but they are never going to um, run into each other in any way. If, uh, if you, again, picture this in a three-dimensional space, uh, where bl the blue and the green are separate planes and all of that, even though it looks like it's going to intersect here, again, think three-dimensionally, right? A little hard to draw it on this two-dimensional picture, but hopefully the image um, makes sense. Next, we're going to talk about angles. So an angle is formed by two rays with a common endpoint. In this case, we have ray BC and ray BA, and their common endpoint, B. The vertex is that common endpoint, so B is the vertex of this angle. The sides are the rays that make up the angle. So we call ray BC the initial side and ray BA the terminal side because of this arrow that I have drawn here. So this arrow marking the angle says we're starting at the initial side and ending at the terminal side. We could have picked either way, but this does matter for certain pictures because we need to know that we're not starting here and ending like that. So it does matter that we mark where we are. Um, the verte uh, the, uh, this angle can be denoted in multiple different ways. So we can call it uh, angle ABC, which is the most rigorous way of naming an angle, is just give the three points that make it up. Um, we could also call it CBA. What we wouldn't call it is, for example, uh, BAC, because BAC implies that we are connecting with A as our vertex. So the vertex must be the letter in the middle. It has to be in order with the vertex in the middle. We can also call it angle B, but this gets into a little bit of a iffy situation if there are more than one angle here. Because if I had another angle like this with another point, and let's call this D, well, angle B could denote this angle, this angle, or this whole thing. So calling it angle B is not the safest bet. Sometimes it's unambiguous in a picture like the this picture, but in general you want to be very careful about that. Um, finally, we could also just name the angle itself by giving it some sort of variable, or sometimes we'll even use numbers to denote angles. So here I've just called it X, and so this is now angle X. I gave it a name. But how do we work with angles? In general, we work with angles be by having to measure them. That's the most important thing to take away from angles. So the measure of an angle is the amount of rotation from its initial to its terminal side. Um, in like real, the real world, we have a tool for measuring angles. It is called a protractor, which is pictured here. This is a protractor. Um, so this protractor measures angles in degrees, but we can also measure them in what is called radians or gradients. That's not going to come up in this class, but if you continue on with later math classes, you might run into those terms. Um, but we can do the measurement by just reading, taking our, uh, our initial side, laying it along this flat line, and then our terminal side, reading where does it end up on the protractor. In this case, it is between the 20 and 30 on our smaller numbers, because if you notice, uh, we want to start from zero and go up. Um, so we ignore the larger numbers. The larger numbers would be if our angle was in this direction. Um, so we are at approximately 25 degrees. We use this notation, M, the angle symbol, X, uh, to mean 
measure, m just means measure of angle x, and so this says measure of angle x equals 25 degrees. Angles can also be classified by their measures. So, um, first classification is the right angle, which always has a measure of 90 degrees and is denoted by a special symbol. So instead of the typical um, angle symbol that we saw previously, um, we have now a just like an up and a, uh, well, it's a right angle. <laughs> it's, it looks sort of like, um, like a little corner with then a little box in that corner. Is the box we can even um, use on a on a uh, figure to sh denote that we have a 90 degree angle. So this tells us that angle is 90 degrees without us having to write it out. Whereas for any other angle we would have to write the actual number to say what its measure is. Next we have an acute angle um, which always has a measure less than 90. You can remember this by just the it's cute, it's small, right? It's smaller than 90, it's the smallest angles are acute. Um, then an obtuse angle has a measure greater than 90 degrees but less than 180. And finally, a straight angle has a measure of 180 degrees because it looks like a straight line. Now you may be wondering, well what about angles greater than 180? Those are called reflex angles, and in this case we're not going to talk about it um, in this class. It's not going to come up so much, but it's still something to think about. If I have an angle that goes like this, that's the reflex angle. But we don't need to get too much into that. Assume that all angles are 180 or less for our purposes, that we are looking at the side of the angle that's 180 or less. Now we can um, talk about the relationship between certain pairs of angles. Uh, adjacent angles are angles that have a common vertex and a common side, but no common interior points. So for example, if I had um, this angle and that angle right there, those are adjacent. Notice that they share this common vertex, they share this common side, but they do not share an interior of the way. For example, if I had uh, this angle and this angle. Those are on top of each other, so they share common interior points. Um, so those would not be adjacent while this would be. Adjacent just meaning next to. Um, complementary and supplementary angles are very related to each other because complementary angles are just two angles that measure, uh, that together add up to 90, supplementary add up to 180. If you have trouble remembering which is which because those names are not particularly helpful, I just think I just always remembered it as alphabetical. So 90 degrees comes before 180, complementary comes before supplementary in the alphabet, so hopefully that's helpful. If you can come up with a better mnemonic than that, please feel free to share it with the class. <laughs> now, for example, if we assume that in this figure EA is a straight line, we want to determine which angles are complementary and which are supplementary, and then we'll find the measure of a particular angle. So note here we have a 90 degree angle symbol, so that tells me that ABD is in fact 90 degrees, which means anything making up ABD must be complementary, which gives us this angle and this angle together have to add to that 90 degree angle. So ABC and CBA together are 90 degrees. Then supplementary, again we're looking for pairs of angles here that add up to 180. So we have the kind of obvious one of ABD being 90 degrees and then um, DBE being another 90 degree angle because together they form a straight line. But we also have ABC with CBE because together they also form a, a straight line. So we have two pairs of supplementary angles in this picture. Now we're going to use the fact that we have this pair of supplementary angles to figure out the measure of CBE. So CBE is this angle right here from C to B to E. We want to figure out what is its measure we know it is supplementary with ABC, and we know ABC is 31 degrees, which means that together they have to 
add up to 180 degrees, and we already accounted for 31 degrees, which leaves us 180 minus 31, 149 degrees total. Another um, interesting relationship we can get is when two straight lines intersect, the non-adjacent angles formed are called vertical angles. Vertical angles always have the same measure. So here I have two lines intersecting and angles one and three and two and four are vertical angles. They are across from each other. That's what vertical angles means. Notice that in the picture, it kind of reflects what we're talking about. They should have the same measure. One and three look to be the same. Two and four look to be the same. Then a line that intersects two different lines at two different points is called a transversal. Special transversals can be, um, have a lot of interesting properties when these lines that, they are, that are being intersected are parallel to each other. So for special transversals, we get um, what is called alternate interior angles, alternate exterior angles, and corresponding angles, each of which have the same measure. So, in, uh, so alternate interior angles, we look to the interior, which is these four angles, and the alternate are the ones that kind of opposite each other. Alternate exterior angles, we look to the exterior, which is the outside and then the angles that are sort of opposite to each other. Corresponding angles are the ones that actually look like the same angle um, in the same position in either um, of our angle sets. Each of these gives us the same measure. So what that really means altogether is we're going to end up with only two possible angle measures throughout an entire transversal. Let's explore that a little bit further though. So here we have two parallel lines um, cut by a transversal. We wanna determine the measure of all the angles. We're told that angle eight is 52 degrees. Notice that in a transversal, we often just number our angles for ease instead of having to go X, Y, Z's and so on and so forth. Um, these numbers do not represent their angle measures because there's no degree symbol, so it's just we're naming the angles with a number instead. Now, starting from our knowledge that the measure of angle eight is 52 degrees, we know that angle eight and angle six are vertical angles to each other, which means they must be the same. Next, angle eight and angle five, right here, are supplementary angles to each other. That means they have to add up to 180. So 180 minus 52 is going to be 128 degrees. Next, angle five and angle seven, those are vertical angles to each other as well, which means they must be the same. Now we use our properties from the previous page to say, well, angle seven and angle one are alternate exterior angles to each other, so they'll be the same, 128. Uh, angle four and angle six are alternate interior angles to each other, which means they will once again be the same at 52 degrees. Uh, angle six and angle two are corresponding angles to each other, so they will be the same. And then finally, angle three and angle one are vertical angles to each other, so they will be the same, 128. Now notice I decided in here to use alternate exterior, alternate interior, corresponding, all of that. There were a lot of other ways I could have gotten each of these. I could have said, well, one corresponds to five, four to uh, eight, three to seven, six to two. I could have just used all corresponding. I could have used um, all, all uh, exterior and interior relationships. I have more than one option of how I can think this out. Or once I get a single one of these angles, I could get all of them using the same relationships I did up here. The point is, is that we can visually see which ones kind of look the same. And so remembering that, Throughout a transversal, you should always end up with the same two angle measures, one, uh, 128 and 52. 
these two supplementary angles. One should be obtuse, one should be acute, unless they're both 90 degrees, that's the only way that doesn't work. And we can see which one is obtuse and which one is acute. And so all the obtuse angles are the same, all of the acute angles are the same. Do you need to be able to power it back at me what it means to be alternate exterior, alternate interior, etc. No, but you do need to be able to figure out um, which ones are the same and what the angle measures is, are throughout an entire figure.